and business here. So let me just briefly start by introducing myself. My name is Abby Stevens. I really enjoy Canvas. I think this is a great product and I enjoy teaching it. My background, uh, let me bring up this slide, is actually more in writing and editing. Most recently I worked at a health and wellness company as a copywriter and then before that I did online journalism. So I graduated with my degree in communication and an ethicist in journalism and then I minored in English. And just for fun, I absolutely love audiobooks and podcasts. Um, but what I like about this training is it's scheduled for two hours, but it's nice that there's, I mean, it generally doesn't take that entire time. So I have time to get to know your institution, who's here, and um, you know, to really help you understand Canvas from the admin perspective. But first, let me introduce the main people you'll be communicating with at Instructure, and then I'll get to know you a bit. So just starting out, your go-to person is your customer success manager. We call them a CSM. This is the person that's going to stay with your, with your school the entire time you are with Canvas. So they're with you for your entire life of Canvas, and they're um, they know how to answer your questions, and if they don't, they know how to take care of it to direct you to people or talk to those people themselves to help you out. And then in addition to your CSM, you have an implementation consultant. We call them ICs. These are the people who do the tech side of things. They help with branding and customization. They are the people who set up that authentic authentication as well as course migration. They are also helping with the SIS integration. So there are a few things in this training coming up that um, I'm going to point out to you. They're more in the realm of the IC, but I want you to be aware that this is the person you'll talk to for that. And then I'm your trainer. Really what I'm helping to do is help you see the features and options you have available through Canvas, especially best use cases for your specific institution so you can know how to really utilize the tools that are available to you. But this is fun. I understand we have a group together. Um, if there aren't too many of us, I think it'd be nice. I saw the Google Doc, but just introduce your name. What is it that you're doing with Blake? And, um, and then we'll get into these other questions. But that'd be great. Um, I'm not sure if you're near the phone to introduce yourself, but let's see what we can do. I, I am Alicia Ruder. I'm the project lead for the Canvas implementation. Awesome. Good to have you with. Covington, Director of Information Management, and I'm the backup for Alicia. Very cool. I'm Dan Trotman. I'm the Assistant Director of ISS for Learning Technologies, and I'm a uh, science teacher at the upper school as well. And uh, with us um, today as well is Sean Hickey, and Sean is at our upper school right now, and he's um, virtually in with us, but he said he, he can't find a way in this system to use his microphone and he'll maybe try to call in, but we should watch for him on um, chat if he has questions. Okay, I'll be watching that. Okay, Sean is a technology specialist um, at the upper school and a computer science teacher. Hi, awesome. I'm, Maylene, oh, sorry, I'm Maylene Krieg, and I'm a science teacher in the middle school as well as a tech integration specialist there. And I'm David Boxer, and I serve as the director of information support services. Awesome. Sounds like we have some very intelligent people in the room, and by some I mean all of you. It's good to have you with. Um, I think it's nice that we have a variety of people, especially with different backgrounds and in different areas for your specific district. Um, that way you're able to help out more people. I think the more that it can spread, the better. So that sounds like a great setup that you have right now. Um, but looking at this slide right here, I'd like to get to know a little bit more about your district. Would one of you mind telling me, you know, just about your district in general, what its mission would be as well as then you can get into student demographics and then we can talk about previous other LMSs you've used. So I'll try to do the one minute elevator speech. Uh, so we are a <laughs> private school uh, serving pre-kindergarten through 12th grade students located on three different campuses in Minnesota. Um, our Canvas rollout uh, will be a three-year implementation. Uh, in its first year, it will be replacing uh, Moodle, which we've been using at our middle and upper school or high school, grades 6 through 12, for the last 10 years. 
and uh, in year two of the rollout, we will be expanding it to the upper school, which has also been using Moodle for the last 10 years, as well as uh, to our lower school, um, which is grades pre-K through five, uh, which will be the first time um, that um, that division will be using the same platform co for communicating to students uh, or families. Awesome. So this, when you say private school, so it is those three different campuses, like K through five, middle, and then high school, is that correct? No, that would be the same model. No, we, we have a model where we have one campus that serves our high school. Um, we have uh, one campus that serves one of our, we have one lower school with two different campuses, but they both serve uh, pre-K through five. And one of those three campuses shares one of those campuses with the lower school, which is our middle school. Uh, so uh, we have two campuses for uh, lower school, and one campus for middle school, and one campus for upper school. Okay. And so am I correct in saying, in calling it a district, or what do you call all of these schools together? One school with three different, uh, what we call divisions, um, or three different schools. I think there are uh, some similarities with the district model, um, but we are a private school, so we, we uh, have different uh, sort of outcomes and accreditation. Divisions. Yeah, divisions. Okay. It's divisions, but we're one school. Okay. Yeah. We have roughly, that helps uh, me understand. roughly 1,360 students. 1,300. Okay. Uh, you know it. That's great. And then do any of you, um, what's been your previous experience? So it sounds like you've been using Moodle for the past six years. Um, have any of you been dipping into Canvas at all, or will this be brand new for you? Just a, a tiny bit of just trying Canvas out. We do have a couple of teachers who have used Canvas um, in, at other places. Um, or that are doing some teaching at the uh, college level and use Canvas for their courses there. So we have a few people with more experience, but most uh, most teachers, including myself, have just used Moodle and have just done a little bit of, you know, kind of two hours of trying out Canvas. So. This is Dan. Okay. This is Dan. I've um, been using Moodle for 17 years. Um, you're a Moodle expert. Yeah. Yes. Using an guess. Um, and I have been using Canvas pretty intensively for the last week or so, including till about <laughs> one o'clock last night. So I've been playing a lot with importing our our courses and just seeing what it looks like um, to take every different kind of course we have and import it and see what the um, results are. Um, so far, mm -hmm. so good. Be a oh, good. So, have you been seeing those courses coming over all right then? Yeah, they've been coming over great. You know, there's some things that we get some duplicates on some things, but it's really easy to clean up. I'm going to be working with um, some of our math teachers to figure out some of the quiz cleanup stuff because the formula based tests are coming in a little bit weird, but I think it's going to be a pretty quick fix on those. The formula -based That's good. I'm happy to hear that. And I'm curious, have you already been in touch? Oh, I'm sorry, I cut you off. Go ahead. No, 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 I was done. Um, have you been in touch with your implementation consultant at all? Have you already got a jump start on um, migrating like batches of your courses over or with your FIS integration? Have you tapped into I, that at all yet? I've got integration pretty much all set up. Awesome. You guys are so on the ball. I think what Dan was talking about was actually bringing over the courses from Moodle into like the common area. The, da the data. The data in the courses, but we, um, Alicia, imported all the the shell courses and the teachers and sent that kind of test out. But in terms of bringing data over courses, specifically archives from Moodle into um, Canvas, uh, because we're only going to be implementing our middle school next year, and it's probably going to be less than 80 courses. We're going to bring them over manually, um, one at a time, using an intern. But we think it'll go pretty smoothly. Um, perhaps, mm -hmm. depending on how that goes, uh, we may, in a year, talk about what would it be like to move over our upper school and whether or not um, we need help with that. But we've already spoken with um, some of your 
your folks about you know what that would cost and what that looks like to bundle it and do it as a, a big data dump. Mm -hmm. well, good. It sounds like you're right on track to see how you want to bring everything over. I'm happy to hear that. Um, I'll be touching on a few of those things, and like I mentioned earlier, that's more for the implementation consultant, and it sounds like you're in a good place, but I'll point those out later on in this training. Um, so what we're looking at right now is the agenda for what we will be covering. Um, we're going to start just with the general organization of Canvas itself, talking about the root account, sub accounts down from there, how you can divvy it up with that organization. And I'm thinking a lot of these things may feel familiar, especially because you've been using um, Moodle for so long. I, I'm not totally familiar with Moodle, but I'm imagining there's quite a bit of crossover. From there, we'll get into different roles and permissions that you have for your users. We're going to talk about the settings, how to get analytics and statistics, and then we'll end by talking about shared resources. And I understand um, you talked specifically about Commons, which was a, it's really a newer feature that we have, and we'll finish up with Commons and the shared resources. But unless there are any questions, we can go ahead and jump right in. You good? Okay. So let's talk about the organization of Canvas. So at the top of it, we have what's called the root account. And that's a, what everything goes into for your instance of Canvas. And so all of your users are going to go into this root account. And then from there, you start dividing it out in places that you need it to go. So under the root account, we have what are called sub-accounts. And these can really vary. It sounds like for your particular school, like each of the sub-accounts can be a different division. They can be, I'm trying to think that might be what you'd want to do. And you may notice, too, is that you can have sub-accounts within a sub-account. And so you can get really specific in how you set up this structure for your instance of Canvas. And let me tell you the four reasons why we really encourage people to use sub-accounts. And then we can talk about how you are looking at organizing your own instance. But one of the reasons we really encourage sub-accounts is just for the organization. They have that structure that really makes it solid behind the scenes. But another is that you get you can set specific roles and permissions for that specific sub-account. Uh, let's say you have a principal within a sub-account that you want them to have special permissions as a principal, but they don't need to have those permissions for all of the schools. So if they're in that specific sub-account, they have those permissions within their area, but not other sub-accounts. So it keeps it specific to what they have jurisdiction over. You can also get specific reports and analytics for those sub-accounts. You can break it down and get the stats you're looking at for a specific area. And then lastly, you have those shared resources. Let's say there's a rubric you really like for the middle school that isn't quite relevant for high school. If you have a middle school sub-account or something along those lines, you can share those resources just within the area that would need them. But just looking back at these sub-accounts, do you have any thoughts right now? Is this something similar to what you're seeing or you've been doing in the past, or is this different? Yeah, that's about right. Similar. So do you feel like you have an idea already of how you'd like to be setting up your both root account and sub well your how you would like to set up your sub accounts? Yeah, they're pretty much already all set up how we like them. Is there anything you guys know what you want. That's great. <laughs> Abby, is there anything you're thinking um, about what some other schools have done that you would warn us against? Um, I'm just thinking so it sounds like yours is a little bit different than what I've seen for most schools. Like for districts I've seen things like um, one sub-account could be all the high schools, and then which, within that, they divided the high schools into different sub-accounts. And then again, a sub-account for middle schools, and then breaking it down from there. Uh, it really just depends. I've seen some, this is more at a university level, but people like to divide by department. Um, some people may like to do it by grades. I've seen a lot of different things. And I'm curious, so how do you see yourself dividing up your sub-accounts right now? So the way, so do you have access to our uh, uh, instance, or is that, I mean, you can just talk to I do. Let me, I just want to make sure that this is your instance. Let me go back. I can share the screen here. Well, one question I would have, and for us to maybe think about, is right now we just have it by division, a lower, middle, and upper, and we might add athletics later. But is there an advantage to adding um, grades? You know, I'm thinking about the analytics that I think you're going to get into. You know, what advantages would it 
give us. So we could drill down maybe by grade and then we could do a whole division or by department. So I'm trying to think of from like their perspective and maybe what other schools have done with those so we can get an idea of how the analytics would be different depending on the sub accounts we set up. I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear all of that. The phone was a little bit quiet. Would you mind repeating some of that? I apologize. So right now we have our sub accounts just by division, lower school, middle school, upper, and then we have two lower school campuses within lower school. But I know mm -hmm. that by department was mentioned and, and grade level was mentioned. What are the advantages or disadvantages by drilling down even further within those divisions? And I'm specifically thinking about reporting and analytics, maybe what others, what mm -hmm. have others done, and how would that be advantageous or disadvantageous for us to do something like that? I think um, it just depends. Like I feel like in the past, do you feel like you need to see specific uh, you know, statistics for, let's say, the seventh grade. Is that something that um, you feel like you've needed in the past, or do you feel like the divisions you have are sufficient for your needs? Okay, so I'm we sorry, have just... classes that have two grades in a class. Can, will it break okay. that sub-account, or can we have them in both sub-accounts, or how does that work? You can. There really it's just a lot of different ways to divide. So I have your school up. Am I looking at the correct school right here? Yes. Yeah, on the screen? Mm -hmm. um, I'm just looking at this right now. I think this looks good. It just depends. I mean, it's always just another step. I always feel like the simpler way is just more effective because it's, I mean, it keeps it simpler, um, less likely to for finding errors here and there. I can look into the other schools and ask them what some of the benefits, like what they like about their setup. But I think what you have right here is a good approach, honestly. Um, yeah, I think this looks good from what I'm seeing. Um, why don't I talk to some of the other schools and get some of their feedback for what they like for the benefits? But I think you're in a good place. How we had broken up uh, Moodle after you know some years of trying different things, and it really stuck. So I think there's some familiarity here as well. Yeah, and I think that carries strength to it. That um, Canvas, I mean, it will be new, it will be different, it's going to be transition for people. So anywhere you can get that familiarity where something's already been working in the past, I think that's a good thing. But let me, I'm going to go back to those slides we were looking at earlier. It sounds like a lot of these things you're familiar with, which is great. But I just want to check in to show you um, some of the other things that go along with this, because I think your sub-accounts look really solid. Um, because under the sub-accounts, you'll notice that you have courses. And when I talk about courses, it's also important to keep in mind the different term dates that go with that. Um, do you have your classes, are all your schools the same? Do you have them all by semester or some trimester? How do you set up your terms? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> There's variety. For the most part, they're all uh, quarters, quarter based. Okay. But, um, there's some, uh, like the middle school has mostly just year terms, whereas the upper school has more semester courses. Also, a kind of odd oddball course is the middle school arts rotation, which is on trimesters. So yes is the right answer. <laughs> OK. Let me show you. So this is a chart. I realize you can't read a lot of this, but this gives you a general idea. So it sounds like you have a lot of different kind of course terms set up, and you can specify those for what you need. Um, but what I'm showing you here is just the different availability dates you can set for your terms. So you can have teachers access their course a week before it starts and a week after it ends. And students, you can just have, give them access the day it starts and the day it ends. So you can differentiate who has access to the course. Um, well, you can change it according to your needs. And you can do that. I mean, you can change the dates according to the courses for what they need. And then underneath the courses, if it's applicable, you can put sections under them. For example, if I teach American history both Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 
and then the same class but a different section on Tuesday, Thursday, I would under enroll those sections under the courses. I've seen some schools put the sections directly under the sub-account, but that's like creating the same course three times rather than one course with multiple sections. So that's something to keep in mind. Oh, you already have that set up? Yep. Awesome. We did not have that opportunity with Moodle, which is frustrating. Oh, well, I'm glad that this is working out then. Um, and then at the root of everything, at the bottom, you have the enrollment. So teachers are enrolled as teachers, students are enrolled as students. So everyone's put into the system where they need to be. Um, so it sounds like you guys have a really great head start. Do you have any questions, what I've shown you so far? Aside from, I'm going to ask some other schools about what they like about their setups. But any other questions that have come up? No, we're good. Oh. I, I like that. Um, page that you showed with the term structure, could you send that to us? The term, oh, this? That one, yes. Yeah. Or is that in um, a PowerPoint that you'll send us? I'll send you the webinar. I can also take a screenshot of this and send it along. It'll probably be easier to read that way. Yeah, it's, it's really small. And I know. The text, I wouldn't even recommend trying right now. It's tiny. I had to zoom up. <laughs> So yes, I can send this along. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So why don't we go ahead and move in. We've talked about the organization of Canvas. Um, we are going to transition into the users and permissions. So I'm going to start sharing my screen and to get over into my Canvas. And I can even go back and forth between my trainer's instance of Canvas and then the one that your school has. So are you seeing the screen right now where it says Blake? Yep. Awesome. So I, right now I'm in your school's instance of Canvas. I'm going to scroll over here to this trainer's instance just to show you, and we can keep going back and forth. And actually, if you prefer to have me in Blake, I can do that. I just want to make sure I'm not doing anything that you would not like me to do in your instance. Do you have a preference for which one I use? I think it would be helpful to see, with the assumption that when you're showing your trainer's instance, different approaches, right? Because what, uh, and then we can say, oh, let's take a look at ours. Uh, because my assumption is that you will have uh, some practices that you're going to recommend. So it seems to me to start with staying in your instance. OK. We can always go back to Blake as needed. But yeah, I'll start in mine just to show you. Because mine's a little bit more filled out. Keep in mind, this is still fake. So you might not see any real analytics. But they are very similar. So I just want to point out this sub accounts tab over here on the left-hand side. This is like what we were talking about for the structure. So you can see at the very top, here's my canvas. This is my root account access right here. At a glance, I can see that I have 20 courses in here and 30 sub accounts. So it tells you underneath what you have. So here's my root account. This two-year program is one of my sub accounts. And this ultrasound tech program, and here I can see there's a course. So at a glance, you can scroll down. And this is something it seems like you're familiar with because you already have it set up. But you'll notice when you hover over this plus sign, it tells you add a sub-account. You can come in and edit the name if you need to. And you'll notice that you can't delete a sub-account if it has courses in it, which is kind of nice. It's just catching you to make sure you're not deleting something you don't want to. But that's how that structure works when scrolling down. And looking, at, I'm back at your instance. Uh, this is great. I can see you have five sub-accounts. There are three courses in here. There are two sub-accounts within the sub-account. So it's a good way to get a glance or just you know, um, a visual representation of what the organization looks like. From there, I just want to point out that I'm just reviewing some things we talked about. At the top on the left-hand side, I can view all the courses that are within my instance. This is nice, especially for troubleshooting purposes. I can come in, let's say I want to go into this ancient civilization classes, class that one of my teachers is in. I can see at a glance there are 21 students in here. I can look at the course of settings, the statistics, as well as the home page. So I can get a lot of information from right here and go in and help my teacher if needed. There's also, oh excuse me, um, the terms which we talked about. This is where I can set specific terms for my courses. So let's say generally they're on a quarter basis. And when you scroll down to the bottom, I have so many fake ones in here. Scroll down to the bottom left, there's the option to add a new term. So I could call this um, 
first quarter, fall 2015, and set all the courses to that that it's applicable, and then I can create a new term for year-long middle school course, something along those lines. And you'll notice over here, here are the term run dates, and then I can specify when students can access it, teachers, and then I also have the option for TAs and designers if I want to give them a different time to access it. And you can still come in and edit and delete them if needed. But let me move over to our users. Were there any questions about this? This is things we kind of already talked about, but now you're just seeing it in Canvas itself. Any questions before I move on to users and permissions? No. Awesome. Well, users is its own tab over here on the left-hand side. These are all the users that are enrolled in Canvas. And what's nice is, again, I can get quite a bit of information on them as needed. So let's say I wanted to check in on Cindy Brady. I can just click on her, and I can see a lot of information. When this loads, I'll be able to see, you know, here's her name. This is how I can contact her. I can see all the courses she's enrolled in, keep track and see how she's doing. And again, for troubleshooting purposes, there's this neat button over here called Become. When I click on this, I'm able to masquerade as that user. I mostly see this for troubleshooting as far as like support desk goes, if students or teachers are running into issues. You can masquerade as that user, so you become them and see if you're running into that same issue and also seeing if you can address any of them that come up. So that's a nice thing to keep in mind. You don't have to use it, but it's good to know that it's available. Cindy? Oh, I'm sorry, you're not Cindy. <laughs> <laughs> you're Abby. But well, right now, Abby, you're playing Cindy. Um, yes. If you're, if you're playing, if you're masquerading as Cindy, does it show up in the logs later? Does it show on the log? Oh, I see. Auto logs. In fact, that you're the one who actually. So I'm just wondering. I mean, if if we were trying to do something like find out when a student was in in, in the the environment and what they uploaded and you know, let, every once in a while we have an incident where we need to find out, you know, when a, when a student was in the environment and not in the environment compared to what they maybe told a teacher or a dean. If the dean goes in as them, or not the dean, but maybe an administrator goes in as them to try to recreate something, will it then show up in the logs as that person actually being in, or is Canvas smart enough to know not to track that as the person? You know, I'm not sure about that, but I don't think Canvas is that smart, unfortunately. I think it will still show, because right now you'll notice it's showing in the upper right-hand side that I am Cindy Sue. Um, let me make a note on that just to check. So you'll notice I can go in and do anything Cindy Sue would, and I would go to the bottom right to stop masquerading. Yeah. I mean, if you could just stop masquerading right now and then go to her um, profile. Analytics. You win the last login date was, and you can see if it was just now. When you were on the screen where you were just about to masquerade, Ezra, there was a message at the top that said that, you know, that you could do things and then other people would see you as Cindy, but then um, later in the logs it said it would show up as, uh, I, when it was something yellow that showed up at the top, maybe when you click there, there right there. Yes, there's your answer. Oh, so the oh, audit yeah. logs show that the administrator was in, not Cindy. And it looks like the login information um, says Cindy was last logged in in 2013. Yeah, you're right. She's not been doing her homework. But yeah, that does answer your question. So the audit logs show you that you were the ones performing the actions on behalf of the user. So Canvas is that smart. I learn something new every day. <laughs> And it does look and like we see the, the login information or the, the information that Dan was mentioning. It looks like we can monitor that or, or check what students are telling us um, from this screen without having to actually masquerade as them, but just looking at their, their, right, their login information. And you don't even need to go to become. You'll notice when you click directly on the user, I can see right here her last login information. You'll also notice even under the 
uh, just reports that every teacher has, they're able to see their students' participation in the course. So it doesn't even have to be at the admin level. Teachers can see their students' activity as well. These are good. Any other questions about users? in the room if you already figured this out, but uploading student photos from our from a database of, of pictures from like a CD we get from our photographer. Um, uh -huh. Is that a relatively easy process? That something a lot of schools I'm actually do? not familiar with how that works. Let me I'm gonna make a note about that. We'll deal with it later with our implementation session. No, that's a good um, yeah, I'm making a note of it. I'll look into it and get back to you on that. So that's great. Any other questions about users before I move on to permissions? Okay. Let me go over permissions is another tab that you see over here on the left-hand side. And this is where I can set different permissions for, like different roles and permissions for my users. So you'll notice there are five default roles that you have in Canvas. Student, TA, teacher, designer, and observer. And an observer, the idea behind that, that's like a parent. If you want to give your parents permission to go in and view their students' grades, that's what an observer would be. Sorry, was that a question? So I'm just saying we already are using parents as observers. Within awesome. The Great. So it sounds like you're familiar with this. This box you see here, you see either a green check mark or a red X. When you click on it, you can enable or disable some of those permissions. And you may notice, too, there's enable, unlock, and disable, unlock. The difference between that is if you were to lock something at the root account level, that means someone in the sub-accounts the sub below you cannot override that. Or if you have a sub-account within a sub-account, the person in the lower sub-account can't override something with a lock on it. So that's the idea behind the lock. Otherwise, someone can go in and change it according to what they need for their sub-account. So you'll see there's quite a few different permissions available. You can also add roles over here in the upper left-hand side. Let's say you need a student teacher. You can choose the base type for what they're closest to. So a student teacher is going to be something like a teacher or a TA. Let's go ahead and say teacher in this case. And then I can come in and adjust and disable the things that I don't want them to have access to that my teachers would. And so you can set all the roles that you'll need. And in addition to that, you can also set account roles. You'll notice there's a tab that's next to course roles that says account. And here you can come in and set, you'll notice you can set a principal, maybe a superintendent, whatever you may need, someone with administrative roles that you want to give special permissions to. And it sounds like you've played around with this a little bit. Am I correct in saying that? Yes, I'm what? Do you have any questions about what I've showed you as far as course and account roles go? I don't think so. Okay. Um, like I mentioned earlier, these are a couple. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about authentication and sys import down here in the bottom left. These are things that you'll be talking more to your IC about. And it sounds like you said you've already pretty much finished authentication. Is that correct? Yes. Awesome. And then have you already started on the sys import as well? Yep. You guys are so on the ball. I'm proud. <laughs> it just makes me happy. Okay, so these two, it sounds like you're in contact and already working on these things. So you're in a good place there. Um, with that in mind, I'm going to actually change gears and move into the general settings that you have in Canvas. And you're going to find those in the bottom left over here with these settings. So with settings, you're going to see quite a few different tabs up here. I'm going to walk through all these different tabs and just highlight the key things you should know about them. So I'm in my settings tab within settings. I like to scroll down. Um, I want to point out just a few things. Do you happen to, right now, do you have students take any tests in specific computer labs on the different campuses by chance? No, we do not. Okay. That's the idea behind this. I won't get into too much detail. If you do down the road decide there's a specific computer lab, like a testing center type place, um, you can put in the range of 
computers within this area here. So then your teachers can set up tests and say it must be taken in this testing center. So that's the idea behind the IP address filters. Um, also, you have some fun features that you can turn on. Um, analytics is already turned on. I'd make sure you want to keep that turned on if you want to see those analytics. Um, there's also a site called turnitin.com that's a plagiarism checker. This is where you would come to enable that to allow your students and teachers access to turning that in or integrating that with Canvas. And you'll also see, I just want to point out, oh, once you select that, you have Turnitin settings. So if I were to turn that off, this would not be showing up. So keep in mind, sometimes when you select those things, it gives you additional information to go along with it. This custom link to include in the Help Dialog pop-up can be really helpful. So let me show you what this looks like. Um, when teachers and students, or any user with Canvas, come up to this Help button in the upper right-hand corner, you have these default settings. And these are all ones that you should keep in here. They really are helpful, such as especially search the Canvas guides. But if you feel like you'd like to include the school's website as well, or the Student Help Center, anything along those lines, you're going to do that in this custom link uh, area here. You'll notice you can click on Add Custom Help Link. And so you can add you know, the, the headline, subtext, the URL. And what I really like is that you can make it available to all users, or you can specify I want teachers, students, or admins. So you can get really specific on who you want to be able to see this. And I'm even curious right now, have you already set up your custom links for the Help Dialog pop-up? Say again? Have you? Actually, I'm just going to come in here and see. Have you set up any additional links for your Help pop-up window? Yes. Yeah, we haven't. Um, we, we haven't OK, yes. Yeah. So you have the support desk. That's great. That's with it a little bit. I, I haven't adjusted who it's available to yet. So far, mm -hmm. we don't have any anything in there that we would need to um, restrict it. But that's nice to know you can. Does users mean everyone who can log in? Yeah. I and you you'll notice you can select more than one if you want both teachers and students. So it's not just one or none. You can select more than one. It's not role based. Mm -hmm. But so what's a user if it's not an observer, for example, or a um I think users is just the button to select everyone. So that would include anyone who has a Canvas account. So that is observers, that's your students, teachers, the administrators. Um, that's just a way to cover everyone. These other ones are just if you don't want all users to have access to it. I think we need to be careful because right now it's available for us even when we log in, in the login window, and we want it there because we want to be able to use that to provide help for people having trouble logging in. So we'll probably leave it Oh, there. I see. Good. Awesome. Well, I'm just going to scroll down. I'm still in your instance, and I won't change anything here. But this enabled web services, what this does is it allows your teachers and students to have the option to choose to enable, especially some of these uh, social media sites. If they'd like, they can receive Canvas notifications through, for example, Twitter. And none of those will go on the direct feed. Those are all private messages. Um, but that's something both teachers and students can sign up for if they'd like. And I see that you signed up for Google Docs. I think that's great. I, um, this allows students to submit assignments through Google Docs rather than having to download something and then upload it. And, and it's the same for teachers. They can share Google Documents that way. Uh, I think that's a really useful tool. So it looks like your settings is in a good place. Um, when I come over here to this Quotas tab, I see that you've changed the megabytes for your course size, um, and that's fine. Have you talked to someone about that, or did you just come in and feel like you should up it? Like, it really is fine. I'm just asking. We have. No, it's a great question. Um, but it's good for this group to hear it, to hear my answer as well. Uh, I, I upped it because some of our Moodle courses we'll be bringing in will be, um, I guess some of them are up to three gigabytes. In which case, they said when it actually comes time to importing some of those, which none of those reside, none of those really large ones reside in the middle school. But as we practice with some of the bigger ones, just to you know, as proof of concept, it sounds like 
for example, if a, a Moodle course is three gigabytes, we should actually up this to perhaps six or even seven, because during the import process, it doubles the size, and then it oh. the temp files. So it sounds like having them large while we're in this process of uploading is an important thing. That's good. I didn't realize that the size like doubles during importation. Yeah, it's just it's just good. a separate thing during mm -hmm. while temporary files are being created and parsed. Oh, that's great. So it looks like you're in a good place here. Um, I really have to say I'm impressed by how much you have already been doing in Canvas. It seems like you're really in a good place. So notifications, I see that you already took care of this, which is smart because by default those notifications say notifications at instructure.com, which I'm going to say most people will think is spam because, I mean, Instructure is the company that created Canvas. A lot of your teachers and probably more of your students won't know that. So now they're coming from the Blake School Canvas, which is great. That way they know that it's something from school. Now we're here this admins tab, and it seems like it looks like you've already done this. This is where you can add your admins. And you'll notice when you come down here to click on Add Admin, you can also choose what type of role they are. So I see you have Headmaster as well as Account Admin. You can continue adding those if you'd like additional roles. And you can, I'm sure you noticed already, you can put more than one person in at a time so you don't have to add in, in admins individually. Did you run into any questions as far as adding admins, though, or any questions with your notifications? I would like a to hear a little bit more explicitly about um, uh, admin account roles and the relationship between admin account roles and sub-accounts. Uh, so for example, if you want to have person X have only access to one lower school campus and have a lot more privileges um, than the other lower school campus, how do those two interact with one another? All of these settings are available mm -hmm. at the or within a sub-account. So when we when we go back to sub accounts, you can assign. Mm -hmm. just Once two. you click on middle school, mm -hmm. then you could assign Hillary to middle just school. For that, for that. Did you want me to follow along with this? Would that help? Um, so like if I'm clicking on middle school, and you're talking about adding an admin, let's say at this middle school level. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I'm currently, you'll notice right here, when you follow this breadcrumb navigation, here's the Blake School, and I'm in the middle school sub-account. So in these settings, I go to admin, and I would add the admins that have specific you know, responsibilities over that middle school sub-account. Um, is there a way um, to see a list of all admins, regardless of sub-account? Um, let me check. So I'm going back to the root account level. I thought, oh, would you remind me, I actually wasn't paying attention. Who was the, what was the name of the person? Was it Hillary, you said? Not on this list, but it was on the middle school. Right. You're right. Let me make a note on that, because I'm not sure where you can see a list of where everyone is. Let me actually check under users. Maybe there's a way you can do it there. No. Yeah, so I'm going to make a note on that. Profile, you can't tell if they're an admin or not, as I recall. Are you missing a feature? Yeah. Okay, I made a note on that. I'm going to ask someone because that would be really useful. I'm sure it's somewhere. So yeah, these are great questions. Anything else from what we've covered for these different settings, uh, these different tabs, I mean? Okay. Well, I'm going to move on. I'm going to show you the rest of these tabs. I'm sure a lot of oh, <laughs> did you create this? Did we create this? It's so friendly. <laughs> I actually haven't seen that before. Well, to create a new announcement, you would just come down here to add a new announcement. And what I like about this is you can specify, again, kind of like you saw with the help dialog pop up, exactly who you want this message to go to. So if it's not for the, all of the schools, you can just say, I want you to send this out to just the students or just the headmasters. And you'll notice you have different icons that can go out with these, be it a warning message, an error, maybe something going wrong with the server, information, a question, or a calendar event. And that's really how announcements go out. And you can select more than one of these categories if you need to, or all of them. 
Um, and is that something you see yourself using as far as needing to send out an announcement to everyone within the, all, well, everyone in the school? Can uh, you send an announcement at a sub-account level? I believe so. Let me go in and check. So here I am going into the sub-account. I'm just going to go back into this middle school sub-account. And I think that's what it would work as. Oh, you'll notice actually, so that is gone the Announcements tab. Hmm. So it doesn't look like you can. I'm going to make a note on that as well, but right now it looks like you can. Okay. I'm going back into my settings here. I'm going to skip over reports for right now. This goes with the um, staff and analytics that we'll be talking about in just a little bit, but I'll be coming back to this. But let me talk about the app. I'm actually just going to see. So it looks like you've already put some apps in here. I'm going to give you a brief overview for those of you who may not have had a chance to look at these yet. But it looks like you, some of you are familiar. So with the app, you're going to see a long list of what's available. When you hover over that app, it gives you a brief explanation. When you click on it, you get more, it explains more about it, and you can add the app if you would like to. Um, for some teachers, because it, you can add apps at the admin or sub-account level that go to everyone within that root account or the sub-account, and that's a great way to go about things. If there are some more uh, obscure apps that you're not sure all teachers would like to use, teachers can also add these at their own course level. A good place to look at to really do some investigating for your apps is this link that says See some LTI tools. I'm just opening this in a new tab. This opens up a site called EDU App Center. That's really great for teachers especially because you can search by category. So let's say I want to find a science app for K through sixth grade that works with Canvas. So this narrows it down where I can see reviews, what people are saying about that app, and I can also see if it has a consumer key attached to it or not. So at a glance I can say, see this one has no reviews, but it doesn't have a key, so that means it would be free and I can put it with Canvas. And so this is a good place to see is this an app I'd be interested in, including with my specific course or sub account. So keep this link in mind. Once you have some apps in here, you can view them by clicking on the View App Configurations. And I see I have quite a few apps in here right now. Um, something I notice, and I do this all the time, I see you have Khan Academy in here twice. So you can come and delete the excess one if you'd like to. And that's how you manage the different apps you have. Um, have you had a chance to play around with any of these apps that you've added to Canvas? Mm -hmm. No, it's great. Actually, do you mind, do you want me to delete the extra Khan Academy while I'm here? Certainly, yeah. Okay, with your permission. Okay. Um, currently we're using, we have maybe three teachers who are actively using badges as part of their Moodle course, and mm -hmm. I have it set up with the Mozilla backpacks. Um, is that one that I see it right there. Is that one that? Is it this one? No, the one over there on the right. Um, the open badges. Do you have any this experience one? With, one, with one badge application over another? I don't. Um, one of our trainers might, though. I can send a message to one of my trainers. I think that he is more familiar with them, and I can let you know what he says. Yeah, have someone who has particular um, operational knowledge, that'd be good to know because I'd want to pick one and kind of stick with it if we can, because especially if there's a way to students who have already earned badges in one course, if that those badges do successfully transfer transfer from Moodle, and I know with the particular course I'm thinking of, students can take the course multiple times. So the ability to transfer some of those, if it's a good app, um, would be good. But if it's not a good app, I'd, I'd rather start with the best app and kind of stick with it. And, not be moving around because I would hate for people to lose badges once they've earned them. Mm -hmm. No, I see what you're saying. When we open these apps, is it specific to whatever sub 
council are in, or should we be having a leash to open them so they're school wide? Yes, so right now I'm in the root account access, so this would be these apps that I would be adding are going at the root account. If you want them just at the sub account, you would need to go to your sub account tab over here on the left. And then again, you would just follow the same steps for clicking on the sub account you want, going to the settings tab, and then the app. So that's adding them just at that sub account. Does that help answer your question? Any questions? I'm hearing some chatter. That's great if you're talking to each other. I'm just seeing if there's anything you'd like me to help with. No, you answered that with a with good question, and uh, um, because it's one of the things that we'll take a look at. OK. Would you like me to move on, or do you need some more time to talk with each other about that? No, you can, you can move on. OK. <laughs> So I'm just going to point out this last tab over here on the right-hand side. This is Feature Options. These are going to find some of the beta forms of what's in Canvas. Canvas lives up in the cloud, so it's updated frequently. Uh, and you can see what these are coming. Um, one that I saw they just posted, where did it go? Differentiated Assignments. This is great. So you'll see some really great things. I mean, they're constantly working on Canvas to either work out bugs or implement some feature requests people have turned in. So I would come here often and see what's new and decide if you may want to allow it or turn it off if that's not working for you. I think you'll find some fun things here. And you'll notice with this little carrot, like arrow drop down, you get an explanation that tells you what that feature does. But those are some of the general settings. Um, how are you guys feeling about these tabs I went through? Do you have any more questions or something you'd like me to review before moving on? <coughs> we turn off something at the root level, we can then turn it on at the sub-account level? Mm -hmm. Let me try that. I'm OK. So let's say I want to turn off this. Do I have your permission to do this, or should I do this in my sub? I'm going to do this in the training instance. How about that? Good idea. Uh, so I'm going to turn off this Learning Mastery Gradebook. Do I need to save it? And I'm going to go into a sub account and see if that's still turned off or if I can adjust it. So uh, let's go into my two-year program, settings. Yep, so it looks like I can override that. Does that help answer your question? Yeah. Awesome. So yes, you can. <laughs> Tell me, in the case of some of these, you have on, off, and allow. If it's allowed, mm -hmm. that the, the, whoever holds the course themselves has to select on in their own settings? <coughs> um, I'm actually not sure about that either. I was hoping hovering over it would give me an explanation. And I'm in your instance right now, just so you know. Um, let me try this again. So let's see, I'm going to go into, I'm in my root account, putting the Learning Mastery Gradebook on Allow. I'm going to go into my sub account. So I mean like a teacher user, does that then let a teacher user turn Oh, on? teachers don't, are you saying for their specific course do they see this? Yeah, I'm kind of wondering if that's what Allow means. Does that give a teacher permission to use it, even though it's not forced on for them? That's my guess of how it works, but I'm guessing. Probably, because I noticed that this was now on on. Um, as a teacher, they see slightly different things for their courses. I'm just going to show you what a teacher instance looks like. So this is a teacher instance. When they come down to settings, 
it does look like this. So yeah, you'll see they don't have that allow option. They just have on or off, so they'll see that it's been enabled for them. So I imagine once you say allow, it automatically comes into enabled. You mean on is enabled and allow has that toggle on off? Oh, you get a choice to toggle. yeah, that's, excuse me, yes, thank you for correcting that. On is enabled, whereas allow, it looks like it gives them that choice there. But, you know, just to be safe, I'm making a note of that. All right, any other questions about these settings before I talk about some of the numbers and stats with Canvas? No. Was that a no or a yes? I'm sorry, I just didn't quite hear. We're good to move on. Okay, and we can always come back to this if you think of one later. So I'm going to move over into the statistics side. And statistics, statistics is its own tab over here on the left-hand side. And I know statistics, statistics is something that they're working to beef up. Um, right now, it's not the most useful tool you'll find with Canvas. Um, some things you may be interested in. So you'll notice you have recently started courses, those that were recently ended, as well as recently locked in users. Um, I'm going to be honest, I mainly come to statistics to get to my course or my Canvas analytics over here on the right hand side. So clicking on this, I'm going to see what the analytics look like for my instance. I like that you can see course act your activities by date, what categories are doing, as well as grade distribution. So when I hover over these blue bars, I see page views. So I can see there are 66 page views on January 13th. When I see an orange bar, that means that someone took an action. And by take an action, we mean like a student participated in a discussion, or they submitted an assignment, or took a quiz, something along those lines. So on March 4th, we have three participations and 61 page views. My students are all failing in my fake account. <laughs> and then down here with categories, again, I can hover over to see what my different categories are doing. So assignments had um, you know, over a thousand page views, whereas quizzes has just had 652. So this is where I can get some of those statistics. And what's nice is that you have these at the admin level, but they're also available at a teacher level. So I'm going into my teacher course right now just to show you that as a teacher, I can go to my home page and over here on the right hand side, I can view my course analytics to see how the students in my class are doing. So it looks very similar. I see activity for my course. I see submissions, my students' grades. And I can even scroll down and see how specific students are doing. Like this student has 188 page views and 12 participations. So I can see if any of my students are struggling and reach out to them before it maybe escalates to be more of a problem. So back in that admin um, analytics view, what was mm -hmm. the difference? general and other. Those were the two top, uh, you know, what, what do those mean? That's a good question. Um, I'm going to make a note of it because I'm actually not sure. I have general, that does seem really ambiguous. You guys have such good questions. I wish I had an explanation. Yeah, I'm going to ask about that and I'll get back to you. So let me show you too, just going back into my uh, the root account here. So in addition to statistics and analytics, when I go back into settings, I'm going to go to that reports tab that I skipped over earlier. So here's reports. And you'll notice I have a lot of like just different information to download. I, I, here's information about the sys export that I can download as well as provisioning. Uh, you also notice there's this configure option over here, and you can tell it which term you would like to bring in there. So you can get specific that way. 
Um, and I want to make sure I'm hitting on things that are important. Is this something you could see yourself using at all in the future, or are you currently using something similar to this? Yeah, I think you know, we, it, it's just good to know it's there to use it if, if someone has a question about use or where to focus training or what's not being, to understand what's not being utilized in case we mm -hmm. think there's something valuable that's not being used in courses. But, and then, of course, statistics for an individual in case there's some academic honesty issue or whatever to, to deal with. But otherwise, um, this looks pretty standard, you know, for what I've seen. Right, pretty course. straightforward. We don't, need, we don't need to spend a lot of time on this. Mm -hmm. Do you guys have any questions for what I've shown you as far as the numbers and analytics go? Okay. I'm going to change gears. I'm going to move over into the shared resources that we have available on Canvas. Um, and a good place to start there is something called Outcomes, and that's a tab over here on the left-hand side. And when I say Outcomes, I'm talking about something that's used to track mastery. A lot of times you'll see this um, for schools, maybe the state um, standard for, like, state math standard or something along those lines. And I understand you're a private school. Are Outcomes something you're currently using? Sorry, say that again. Um, or something similar to Outcomes, I should say. Um, you know, it's possible in Moodle. I have no clue if anyone's using it. <laughs> okay. There's a couple teachers who are using it in order to determine um, badges, but the numbers are in the one or twos, and those people will figure this out anyways. I think it'll get used more now that we, it's a little easier, I would say it's easier to do in Canvas than it was in Moodle. So maybe it'll get a little bit more use. Okay, well, I'll explain it to you. We definitely have teachers who are extremely interested in outcome-based grading um, who look at Canvas's tools and say that they're not mature enough yet um, for, for, for prime time. For what they're looking for. But they're improving mm -hmm. what we can see. Yeah, well, let me briefly explain it. Let me know if you feel like I'm getting... Um, into too much detail if you feel like it's not too relevant. But I do want you to know if down the road you feel like this is something you want to use. Or like you are saying, there's some teachers who are interested in this. So like yeah. I said, outcomes are great for tracking that mastery. And it gives you an explanation here. Um, but you'll notice you can create different folders. I'm sorry, am I cutting someone off? No, I think I'm cutting you off. So I think there are two examples that would be worth looking at. Um, okay. One that we've seen as part of uh, Ms. Johnson's instructor training, right, that Teachers can obviously set up their own outcomes based on their own uh, rubrics, but I think exactly, the case yeah. that uh, would be worth taking a look at is I, um, I'm aware, uh, although I haven't seen it for myself, that the math department, for example, uses common outcomes, and I definitely know that uh, what we call specialists, so like art teachers, music teachers in the lower school, use uh, outcomes-based uh, uh, rubrics for reporting to students. and so. Um, I'm really curious to see what it looks like at, uh, you know, either, so there's the lower school version of that, that's the sub-account level, but I'm also really curious, like, how do you, how would this uh, be enacted, um, like bringing an MCTCM or something, right, or display, I'm sure it's like MCTM, you know, asterisk, like slight changes, mm -hmm. um, but, yes, how, how would we facilitate that for, uh, for uh, an entire sub-account? And how would we facilitate that for a department? And I don't know if we can facilitate it for a department beyond sort of like everyone would be able to see everyone's outcome. Right. Well, I'm thinking if it's at the department level, so long as it's at the sub-account, those that it's relevant to can just go and use it, whereas the other people would just kind of ignore it. Um, but yeah, you can create these folders like you're saying. You can create an outcome folder for the math department or that area. And you'll notice you can put folders within the folders, or you can put those different outcomes that they would be looking for there. Oh, excuse me. And um, that's where, that's probably the best place to go about it for, you know, at the sub-account level, and then different departments, you know, as relevant can use it within there. And you, like you mentioned earlier, if there are just specific teachers who are using it, they can go at their own level and create their own outcomes just for their specific course. And to do this, I mean, 
Oh, go ahead. From a structural standpoint, um, I'm just trying to connect a few dots for myself. Um, from a structural standpoint, you can have a parent-child set of outcomes. So, for example, grade one outcomes that uh, uh, that you can also create like a role in which uh, a particular admin, let's say, for example, uh, uh, a lead teacher or an academic chair can publish into outcomes. Because I, mean, I guess what I'm trying to what I'm trying to just, uh, imagine is, you know, you don't want so much of a gatekeeper that outcomes. Uh, so right now, for example, we have one uh, administrator at each sub-account level. Mm -hmm. But one of the questions I'm trying to sort of come to grips with is I wouldn't want one administrator to have to be the gatekeeper for publishing outcomes that are used at, at a department level. And so what I'm trying to connect the dots explicitly about is um, how are outcomes actually published at the institutional level and how, how can you set uh, particular permissions to allow more folks to publish uh, outcomes. Right. No. <laughs> no, this is good. Well, and I'm thinking too, so, and we'll be talking about commons at the end. Commons is a really great place to use this so you don't need that one gatekeeper to kind of, well, because you don't want to create a bottleneck where everything needs to go through this one person because it's, you know, frustrating for that one person as well as everyone else. Okay. And so Commons is a great way to share that kind of content. Um, I'm actually looking it up right now to make sure if you can share outcomes on Commons. Um, that's something I'll have to play around with. But that would be a good way to go about it is that you could share, create an outcome section within your school's instance of com your school's Commons. Okay. That could be a way to do it. Sorry, Abby, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to show you briefly what it's like to create an outcome. It's pretty straightforward, really simple. So you would just click on this new outcome button. Um, and they are for, so you'll notice you give it a name. You can give a description if you'd like. And just by default, you'll notice that mastery is set at three points. You have exceeds mastery and does not meet. If you feel like you'd like to have more options, you can just click on this insert button here and explain maybe you have a one point for almost meets expectations. Um, the idea behind outcomes is really just keeping it simple. You want to make sure, is my student hitting these key points um, to, are they qualified to advance on to the next level? Or something along those lines. Um, and like you'll notice over here, you can create folders of outcomes and put outcomes with folders within folders and put, and you'll notice they're called groups, grouping them together. Um, but once they're available, you know, your teachers will be able to search for these if they're created at the account or sub-account level where they can find these outcomes and detach them. I generally see them attached to rubrics, but they can just stand on their own. That just depends on how you would like to approach that. Um, and even, you don't need points on these. I was talking to a school earlier that just made all of these worth zero points. They just wanted to see and kind of gauge where their students were at. So you have flexibility there as well. Can you change the wording there so instead of exceeds expectations, it can be something else? Um, yes. When you click on this pencil here, this is where you go in and edit it so you can change the wording. All right. Thank you. Looks like it cannot be mm -hmm. edited or adjusted once it's in place. So, right. Yeah. I think you saw that. So I was trying to play around with this. Once this outcome is created, it looks like I want to see if I can click directly on it. That will make a difference. But yeah, this edit outcome looks like it's not available to you. So it looks like if you did want to go back and change an outcome, you probably the best route would just be to delete it and create a new one. What happens if somebody's using it? Will it delete it on there? Mm, no, I think once it's in use out that way, um, then you probably would just need to like create a new one entirely. Can you rename something if it's in use? Can you what? 
rename something if it's in use? I don't think you can edit it once it's in use. Um, but, well, I didn't mean to do that. Let's see. So let me check. Wait, this one's letting me edit it. Hmm. Does everyone else see that? Because now I can go in and I can edit this name. Hmm. You know what I'm assuming is this math outcome is probably in use, whereas this competency base is probably not. That's why I can still edit it. Hmm. Yeah, I think once it's in use, it's off limits for editing. I'll make a note, though, because I always want to make sure I'm saying the right thing. These are great questions, though. Any other questions about outcomes from what I've shown you? I understand that Dion Johnson, she did your instructor training. Is that correct? That's correct. And she went over outcomes and rubrics a little bit. Is that right? Yes, from the teacher point of view, so that any teacher can create right. their own mm -hmm. route. Yeah, that's good. Let me show you just how these are connected. So you'll notice there's an outcomes tab. There's also a tab for rubrics. Or if you'd like, there's also a rubric button over here on outcomes. I'm going to click on the rubric tab over here. And I mean, this is similar to what you saw for teachers. Here's a list of all the rubrics that I've created. So these are at the root account level. Everyone in my instance of Canvas could have access to these. And it's just as easy to create a new one. Um, and then if I wanted this available at the sub-account level, I could go in and create the rubric that way. So um, and you'll also notice you can attach your outcome to the rubric just by clicking on Find Outcome right here. By clicking Find, it's bringing up a list of all those outcomes I have and I can attach the specific outcome that I want by saying import, and they will put that on that rubric. So that way they would go together. I usually see just one outcome applied to a rubric. Um, you can have more than one outcome on a rubric, but I feel like uh, there's generally more. I feel like I'm not answering the correct question here. Um, how, do you, how do you typically see rubrics used with outcomes? Typically, I see I see rubrics. Honestly, I see rubrics used more often than I see outcomes. So I see more rubrics and then occasionally an outcome attached to them is generally what I see. But I have seen it where there's just an outcome. I have seen it where there's just rubrics. Uh, it just depends on how you'd like to go about it. But more often than not, I see just rubrics. So here's how I, uh, here's how I could uh, imagine getting used in a school setting. Let's say, for example, uh, there's a, uh, an outcome that we're assessing all sixth graders on their ability to uh, uh, develop a thesis statement. So that's an outcome that's shared across the entire middle school sub-account. And when a teacher is building a rubric, they can pull that outcome into their rubric. Um, is that, does that seem, I mean, so are outcomes sort of like uh, sort of predefined criterion for rubric? Yes, yeah, that's, that's a good way to put it. I feel like the outcomes are more of the parents that are more uh, just something you see consistently throughout the semester or you know quarter, however the term is set up. That outcomes you want to make sure if my student is you know meeting these expectations and the outcome, they're qualified to advance. Whereas the rubric might be more of just a specific assignment, like you did a good job on this paper type thing. And so, um, yeah, I think what you're saying. Like that makes sense, and I see that's probably a good use for them. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, because I can come back and try explaining another way if it's still a little mud uh, muddled for some people. Okay. People who are using it will know, and the rest of us will catch up. 
Yeah, outcomes are a funny creature. They, yeah, some people love them, some people avoid them. Like, or some people just never use them. I shouldn't say avoid them, but I feel like I they're, they're, people they're either love them or never use them. Language attached to them, and if you're not using them, the language is confusing. So Any more questions about outcomes and rubrics? Okay, well let me move along into the grading schemes that you can set up for a shared out, um, shared resource. That's going to be under here in the grading tab on the left. So you can set up specific grading schemes that your teachers could then go in and use. So you'll notice if I click plus grading scheme over here on the right, I can specify what constitutes an A, an A minus, B plus, and so on. And you'll notice you can have more than one in here. There's even complete, incomplete. That way, something that your middle school is using can be different than the high school. Or if you'd like to keep it all consistent, they can all just be using the same one. So the grading schemes is where you'd come in to use that. And even, I'm just wondering, do you have different grading schemes between your schools, or are they all the same? They're different. Middle and upper might be the same, but lower has a completely different grading scheme because they don't give a mm -hmm. whatever. They have wording or whatever they use. Right. Yeah, so this will be great then. Just give it a title so they would know what they would be using. And that grading scheme would go into that course. Sorry, I cut someone off. Oh, no, you didn't. I, I jumped in. I'm sorry. Um, so are you saying that a teacher cannot just create their own scheme on the fly? They have to ask us to create one for them, and then they can adopt it? No, I, I should be more. So your teachers actually can create their own scheme. Um, they can use this if they want to, but yes, they can create their own scheme as well. That's Actually, obviously. Is that a lockdown permission? Yeah. Is that a permission you're asking? Yeah, can we lock that down? Um, let me check. I actually haven't looked at that. Like if our, upper, if our new upper school director says everyone has to have the same percentages to grades and have that match our Grade book of record. If the, you know an edict comes down like that, can we lock that down by division? Let me check on that because um, I'm not I'm not seeing it over here. So you can see they can edit grades of grade alerts. So what you would like to have, if I understand correctly, is you want you don't want teachers to have access to create their own grading scheme that they can use. You just want them to all use the unified one within their school. Yeah, you know I didn't I didn't say that that's what we want, but I want to be able to answer an administrator if an administrator says if a if a school administrator, um, right, like the head of our upper school for or director of our upper school for example says everyone will be on the same grading percentage wise. Um, can we lock that down to the upper school for example? I thought it was in I thought it was in um, settings, but boy, we've got a lot of elements. This is where it would be. Yeah, although sort of the writ large of them, teachers, they can um, internally manage their own grade book, whether that's on a different table. So that's how we would Because in file web, we could just put them on being that. But they have to convert that to a percent. Absolutely. And I do think having the having the grade book. Might be a feature option, but yeah, if it's not an issue, Gabby can follow up, right? We can move on. Yeah, I'm going to look into it. You guys have so many good questions. I mean, it's kind of humbling. Usually I'm like, oh, I know this, this, and now I'm like, I haven't thought about that. So just to make sure I understand correctly, you just want to know if it's like an option available that, well, not so much that you don't want teachers to have the ability to create their own grading scheme, so much as you just want to know if that's available, that it would be consistent throughout the school. Is that correct in my, in my understanding? Yeah. It, it, yes. OK. Yeah, let me look into that. That's good to know. Um, let me show you. And I'm curious, do you, I'm moving over to question banks now. Unless, are there any other questions about grading? OK. So question banks are a place where you can group together, uh, you know, a group of questions 
Are question make something that you have currently used in the past or, I mean, are using? Um, they tend to be, um, our experience has been, you're talking about quizzes now, right? Yes. So our experience is that teachers who use quiz use a bunch of quizzes. Teachers who don't use many quizzes usually have none at all. Those teachers who mm -hmm. are using quizzes um, have tended not to necessarily share question banks with each other, but it is something you can do in Moodle is set up a public question bank and multiple people can draw from it. Um, uh -huh. I would be curious to have your quick overview. Well, we don't need to spend a lot of time on it, but a, a quick overview of how Canvas handles it. Well, and I think, uh, again, I'm going to ask the same question as earlier. As I understand it, the math department has common assessments um, where this may or may not be uh, useful or even, uh, um, so again, so my same question from earlier, is there a way to create uh, a permission and a sub-account uh, for a particular role so that folks have the ability to just create uh, uh, question banks or rubrics or outcomes um, at a high level? At a high level, right, like at a, a, a sub-account level. So only the person who would have the access to, like, as an admin access at that sub-account, or like they've been given special permissions over that sub-account, can create these for the entire sub-account. Um, there are ways around it, like, um, you know, a teacher can export a question bank, and that admin person could import that question bank. But I think this is where you're really going to find the Canvas Commons come into play. That will probably be the best place to share these types of question banks. Um, and I'll actually get to the commons next to show you what's available there. I think that'll that'll be the best route to go as far as, you know, not this one gatekeeper creating everything or having to import it all, but everyone can just share in that one place. Um, but just for a brief overview of question banks, these are just a, uh, it's a group of questions. I see some teachers, let's say a science teacher creates a photosynthesis question bank that they use for their midterm, and then they use it again for their final. It's just a good place to house a group of questions that you can tap into as needed. And it's nice that you can share those among teachers. And so it's pretty straightforward. You just come to Add Question Bank over here on the right-hand side, give it a title. When you click on it, you can come in and you'll notice you can add a question. I've even seen some teachers that put outcomes on specific question banks because they want to see, you know, do my students understand photosynthesis? And they put an outcome on that. Um, so you have different options. A lot of times I don't see people utilize that. Just know it is available. Um, but these question banks, some of these you also see come with publishers. They either provide quizzes or question banks that you can import. I mean, I would always check the file type. Not all formats are compatible with Canvas, but generally look for a QTI file. Those tend to come over pretty well. Um, but that's pretty much just, well, that's just the overview of question banks, how you create them. And again, if I create them at the root account level, they're available to all my users, all my teachers, I should say. And then at the sub account, it just goes down from there who they're available to. Can you show me where that import was? And can a teacher import just as an admin can import? Yeah, let me show you how a teacher would import. It's pretty simple. So I'm in my teacher access right now. If I come down to the settings tab in the bottom left, over here on the right, I have import content into this course. Okay. And you'll notice when I click on this, you have a lot of different options. So here's Moodle down here. There's also a QTI zip file. And when you click on this, you can find the file. And it's also asking, you know, if it's a question bank, do you want to dump this question bank into one you already have, or do you want to create a new question bank? Um, and just going back to settings, if they say export course content, teachers can choose do they want to export a course or do they want to export a quiz. And so then if they say course, that's everything. Or they can just narrow it down to let's just do my revolution quiz. So yes, that's available at the teacher level. Does that help answer your question? No, it doesn't. For administrator, 
Administrator. Sorry, I'm just looking something up right now. Was that another question? Oh, I said, can administrator write quiz questions but not import them? Yeah, administrator, well, let me, yes, you can write quiz questions. So I'm going back to these question banks. If I click on, let's say, this Alaska questions, by going in the upper right-hand corner, I can add those questions. And this looks just like the quiz this does for our teachers. Let's see here. Sorry, I'm just looking something up right now. I just have, I'm just going to check into where you go because I know, I mean, obviously as an admin you should be able to import content. I'm just a little turned around about where to do that, so I'm making a note of it and I will get back to you on that. Oh, thank you. Uh-huh. So let me switch gears. I mean, are there any questions about what we've covered so far as far as outcomes, rubrics, grading, or question banks? These are those four main shared resources you have in Canvas. Any questions about those? No. Okay, well, I'm going to uh, shift gears. I'm going to go over to Commons. And you may notice I don't have my Commons option up here. This is one that it's a newer feature in Canvas. So you see it's available on your Blake account. And I'm going to give you a brief overview of Commons. This is still new. And it, honestly, it's just exciting to see. So you have three so different categories. Oh, go ahead. Uh, so one of the things that uh, we did earlier this week, and I haven't shared it out to you, Mailing yet, because uh, I just got the recording, is that our customer success manager went over Commons in terms of how to publish and retrieve from the Commons. Um, oh, good. Uh, I can share that video recording um, with Maylene um, so that she, uh, she can see it. But I, I feel actually he spent about 45 minutes going through the Commons. Um, oh, so you're like a Commons whiz by now. <laughs> uh, I'd say we're we just don't need it again. Yeah, I'd say we, we're Commons exposed. <laughs> whiz, maybe. Uh -huh. So that's good. So you have that recording. Um, okay, would you still, would you like me to kind of hold off on this then since you've already had something on it? I think so, yeah. Or was that a yes, hold off? Yes, hold off. Okay. No, good to know. I appreciate you saying something. Um, I'm just going to go back into this site, Admin Access. So those are the main things I wanted to cover in this training, though. We went through, I'm going back to our agenda just to give you an overview. We talked about the organization, users and permissions, those general settings, the staff, as well as shared resources. Just in looking at this, is there anything you would like me to go back over or review at all? Um, in terms of communication, I understand that um, we can set up we can set up chat sessions using Big Blue Button. Those can be recorded and held on to for about two weeks, I think, under the free service that's provided there. Do I have that correct? You have that correct. Yeah, Big Blue Button, two weeks. Um, would you like me to show you briefly how that works? Um, no, I, I don't think so. I was just, I was just, I had heard that and I wanted to confirm it with you. Just a little, a little triangulation. So thank you. That's good. Uh huh. Uh, the last question that I have is around um, uh, communication at the sub account level through announcements. Um, versus groups. Uh, so for example, if a principal wants to communicate to all teachers and all students uh, about a general announcement, um, how I saw it at the school level, but I'm just curious to see how that looks at the sub-account level. So it looks like at the sub-account level, um, let me share my screen again. Because um, I think we 
did this, it looks like I didn't see that available at the sub-account level. So right now, I just want to show you, I'm in my root account access, and then I went into this two-year program sub-account. So I'm at a sub-account level right now. But when I go under settings, I'm not seeing that um, announcement tab up here that I saw at the root account level. And so it looks like I can't, which is strange to me. Um, so I'm going to look into that. I mean, I'm looking at the inbox to see if there's something I could do there. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that's just courses. That, that only full account admins can send an announcement. And that's school-wide. Yeah, yeah well, for a school-wide type thing. But still, only an account admin can even do it. Yes, that's what I'm seeing. I'm going to do some research on that, though, to see what you can do, um, because it would make sense that they should have the ability, like a principal, like you're saying, to send out announcement just for their specific school. Yeah. So let me look into that, and I will let you know what I find. Abby, this is a completely random question, so uh -huh. uh, I'm say <laughs> not right now, but um, just uh, I was working with some, some friends the other day and trying to get started, and we were working on just creating a course, and then we were trying to get a, just a month view calendar to show up on the right-hand side of the page, which we've seen on other courses, and we could find no way of doing that. We can get into the calendar. You know, if we click on calendar, we can see a calendar. So if we're just in a course, yes, yeah, like the June 2015 calendar that was showing on the, if you go back to the okay. course homepage, uh -huh. not just that, and the calendar was showing so up. So just this one right here? Yeah. I'm curious, so it was, were you on your course's homepage? Yes. Was your course attached to um, I think what that has to do with is, so there you have this option up here in the upper right to choose a homepage. Uh -huh. You would need to select the syllabus for that to show up. Like, do you know which of these you had selected? Was it syllabus by chance, or? First module. Oh, okay. All right. Module. So. Yep. So with modules, you don't have that calendar show up. That's with the syllabus. Okay. All right. That's a quick answer. Thank you. That's all I needed. Yeah. I'm glad. Any other questions? And this is great. If you've already been playing around with your courses, we have the leftover time that I can answer any of those questions that have come up. Kind of relating to the announcements, but a little broader than that. Um, you you could restrict that by group, I recall. And what's the difference between a group and a course? And what are the benefits of either? Um, I was under the impression that you could only do groups within courses, um, and that they weren't in a similar level as courses. Can you explain the difference? Are you talking between? about? Mm -hmm. Are you talking about this inbox up here for communication? No, not within a course. I'm talking about the sending an announcement to the entire school sort of thing. Uh-huh. So let me go back in here. So what you're talking about is, like, oh, what's the difference between a group and a course. So these, so are, um, oh, go ahead. So are groups only within courses, and there cannot be groups that are not within courses? Um, I feel like I'm misunderstanding. Just so these are those course rules for those permissions you set up earlier. OK. It, I, it, yeah, it, I'm afraid I'm misunderstanding. Ignore the whole announcement thing. I've just heard the term group thrown out a lot, and I was under the impression that groups only exist within a course. Um, okay. Do groups exist not within a course, or do groups only exist within courses? I feel that because I think I just don't understand what they meant when they were saying a group. Um, a message, I see the only way to, to filter that is enroll, 
and roles are definitely not groups. Kind of cleared up my question. Yeah, I mean, just in, in various Canvas trainings with various Canvas people, I've heard the term group used a lot. Um, it, but is group a thing only within courses? And that's just what I'm trying to confirm, because it seems like right. I've heard it used more than could possibly with be within a course. So I think the way the two ways we've heard it are uh, groups are within the people uh, section of a course, and then the other way that we've heard it um, is for co-curricular activities. So like one of my colleagues um, teaches uh, Lego robotics. That's not a course. You know, we don't uh, actually track enrollment in that course. That's something that happens after school. And so the way that the other way that we've heard course groups are around co-curricular activities that aren't uh, based on a course. That's the two ways I've heard it. Um, okay. I've just heard it thrown out here and there, and I think it's just colloquial talk. Uh, but there's no oh, I'm sure it is, yeah. Um, I wanted to try uh, to group. Yes, but it's only within a course. And there's, there's been times I've heard group thrown out when it's not, but I think that was just colloquial speak, not mm -hmm. I'm making a note of it because I'm sure there's someone else, I'm sure there's a lot of people in the office that are familiar with the term groups. I think I'm with you. It sounds a little vague and I'm not quite sure what it is. So let me look into it and I'll get back to you on that. Okay. No, but I appreciate your questions. I feel like you are all very thoughtful and conscious of how you'll be using Canvas. Are there any other questions? that have come up? 